Hey everybody, today Rado runs through his top 10 games of 2019, but before I get to that, Merry Christmas, if in fact it is Christmas when you're watching this, it's the day I made the video live, um, and if it's not Christmas, or if you just don't care about Christmas, well, then happy whatever day it is, or just I hope you're having a very good day, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, hopefully this will uh, put a spring in your step, because I'm about to tell you about my 10 favorite games of the year, although as always, this is a preliminary list, because I have not gotten everything that has come out this year to the table yet, there's still several really good games waiting in the wings, or that I'm hoping I will be able to get a review copy of, so that I can cover in the next couple of months, because as always, this is a preliminary list I'm putting up at the end of the year, and then in April of the following year, I will revisit the list after I've gotten a chance to hit all the other potential top tenors, and there are a few of them waiting in the wings. And so, come back then, but in the meantime, you're here now, right? You want to hear a top 10 list? You want me to count from 10 to 1 backwards and talk about games? You come to the right place. Let's get going with my number 10 game of the year at the moment. Coloma. Now, this is from designer Johnny Pack, who had a very, very good year. He put out three games, and they're all excellent. Fistful of Meeple, Sierra West, and Coloma. Coloma is, obviously, the best of the three, as far as I'm concerned. It's the uh, heaviest, or the richest, most elaborate Old West town building simulation. In fact, interestingly, the three games kind of create a trilogy. There's Sierra West, which is about um, you know settling the Old West, and then there's Coloma about building a town, and then there's Fistful of Meeples about having shootouts in the town. Uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Coloma, what makes it special? Because this, at its heart, is a game all about you know gathering the resources and money you need to build up buildings that give you special powers to score victory points, and it does that very very well. It very much kind of feels lo almost like a uh, race for the galaxy, but in the American West instead of in outer space. The thing that makes the game special, though, is every round you're going to pick one of several different actions you can do, and there are the actions you would expect in this style of game. But you pick in secret. All the players pick in secret, and once everybody's chosen by kind of programming it in on this neat little wagon wheel, everybody reveals at the same time. And when that reveal happens, you hope, hope, hope that you are the only player who did your action. Because if so, you boom, you get a super powerful version of that action. And on the flip side, if you'd end up doing something that other players did, well, you all kind of scrabble and bounce all over each other at the general store, and you end up doing weaker versions of that action. So every round, it's crucial that you really pay attention to what your opponents are doing, so you have a good idea of where you think they're going to go, what they're likely to do, so that you can avoid them. Unless you're worried that they're going to pull off some really big move, in which case, uh, if you are in a given round, sometimes the big moves for you aren't necessarily going to be as powerful as they might be at other times. So you might say, oh, you're going to go there. That'll be a big deal for you. I better go there myself so that we both get the weaker version. So much of this game is about reading your opponent's mind, getting one step ahead of them, but knowing that they know you're doing that, and that they're doing the same thing to you. So this is all about multi-level um, you know, mind-reading games, and it's fantastic. And not for nothing, uh, the production value of the final version, uh, the, the video I filmed was just of the prototype when it was on Kickstarter, and even that was nice, but the final version is so gorgeous, and absolutely amazing production. The way they use magnets in this, it's really incredible. I think it kind of sets a new standard for this style of game. The art from the Miko, my favorite board game artist of all time, is as always wonderful. And it's a very, very satisfying, rich game with tons of stuff to do. I am over the moon with it. It's my number 10, Coloma. Then we move on to number 9, Cities Skylines, the board game. Now, this is, as you might imagine, a board game version of a very popular video game series called City Skylines, and it is a SimCity-esque game where we are trying to build up our industry, our commercial, our residential, and our civic buildings in the right combination to make a very successful city. There are a few things that make this one stand out from the crowd, aside from the video game tie-in. And I should say, I've never played the video game, so I don't know much about how well it captures the feel of that. All I know is, as a city builder, it is phenomenal because it is cooperative. And that is a real rarity in board gaming. Most SimCity-inspired games are competitive in nature, where everybody's trying to build the best suburb or um, you know, undercut each other and grab the best real estate and all of that. 
I find it so much more satisfying and engaging to work with you. And we both are trying to build a city at the same time that will flourish while dealing with well, really, with the um, the timing issues that we create for each other. Because in this game, you've always got a handful of cards, and on your turn, you're going to play a card that determines what type of zoning you're going to do for the city. Whether you're going to put in some new residential or some kind of new special building with a special power or whatever. And the trick is, most of the buildings and most of the zoning cards that you play in this game, they will have a basic ability that gives you some kind of reward, but if you can play it at the right time in combination with something else that has already been placed, like um, if you wait to build this particular suburb until somebody's built a police station, then the suburb will double its output or will, will give you more stuff. So it's all about trying to play things in the right order. The problem is I've got my cards I want to play, you've got your cards you want to play, and chances are you're the one. I don't want to play my residential until you've played your police station. Um, but you don't want to place your police station until I've built an industrial. And so the puzzle of this game is all about trying to figure out three, four, five moves ahead as we work out right. Okay, if you do that, then I'll do this and you'll do that. Oh, but wait, no, I can't do that because we don't have the money. So I've got to play this other thing. But then that means you won't get the bonus off of yours. And that is awesome. Jen and I really love trying to puzzle out the most efficient way that we could get these things into play. Especially because if you just don't have a good path to maximizing the output of your cards, what you can always do on a turn is you can spend some of your incredibly precious limited resources to um, put a card in a queue. So it, it's something that could be played later. Um, and the benefit of that is it means somebody could play it later, either me or my opponent, because it might have been a card that it um, doesn't produce as much if I played instead of you playing it. The, the core game, it's pretty straightforward. It's doing all the kind of stuff we've seen in a lot of SimCity style games before. But you know what? I love SimCity. And I love working with my wife. And so those are wonderful things that come together to make a phenomenally engaging a little experience. City Skylines, my number nine. Then we've got number eight, The Isle of Cats. Now, I would have to say... Well, one, I guess I should say, some people will be a bit surprised that this is on the list because for the vast majority of people, Isle of Cats will not be available until 2020, and they would assume it is a 2020 game. However, Board Game Geek, uh, which as far as I'm concerned is the ultimate arbiter of such things, has decided that Isle of Cats is officially a 2019 game, specifically because uh, the Kickstarter backers ended up getting their copies in December. I, they're still, they're coming in right now. So, since it's a 2019 game, and since it is probably the greatest polyomino game of all time, uh, it had to make my list. Here's the situation. There is an island of cats. We need to sail our ships to this island and save the cats because the island is in great danger. And um, the cats come on these really cool, colorful, cartoony, polyomino shaped Tetris pieces that as we draft these pieces, we are trying to squeeze them onto the deck of our ship as best we can. Um, and that's half the game. The other half of the game is a very sharp Seven Wonders-esque card draft that determines what cards we will be able to use to play to get the cats to um, puzzle them onto our board and unlock all kinds of special abilities. This game is so sharp. And if you play with all of the built-in modules turned on, it I don't know. I might have spoke a little bit too soon. There might be... I, I, there might be polyomino Tetris style puzzle games out there that I enjoy more, but there certainly isn't one that's heavier. This is the heaviest game that is 100% devoted to that jigsaw puzzle, which I love in so many different ways. And I love the art, I love the presentation, I love the gameplay, I love the card drafting, some of the best two player specific card drafting in any one of these Seven Wonders or Sushi Go inspired style games. And the, another interesting thing, too, is while Jen and I, we had a fantastic time as gamer geeks, you know, really hardcore, um, you know, looking for heavy strategy type stuff, we really enjoyed it. My mother-in-law was visiting at the time, and the game comes with a lighter family gateway friendly variant that we played with my mother because she's a big cat lover, or my mother-in-law. And she loved it too. So it's an incredible... You get two games in one, basically. One you can play with all your hardcore gamer geek friends, and one you can play with all your light, casual, um, not quite gamer yet friends and family. And it works so well both ways. It's incredibly tight, fast, fun. It's super sharp. It's my number eight, The Isle of Cats. 
If only been in dog. If only been dogs. But say, uh, number seven. It came out very early this year. It was actually, I think, the first game I did a run through for uh, back in January. Wingspan. And wow, even though there's been so much stuff that's come out between now and then, it is still tough for anybody to top the excellent engine building of this. Oh, I forget the term. What, what is it? Ornithology? Is that the uh, science of bird watching? This is a game where we are trying to play bird cards uh, into their. One of three natural habitats. We're trying to play them into the, the grasslands or the woodlands or the, the wetlands, depending on what type of bird they are. And you've got a handful of cards that represent all these wonderfully illustrated birds, all of which have special powers that are thematically tied to the real world birds and what they do. And um, the thing that makes this game special is each one of those... Oh, what do you call them? The, the, the environments that you're playing these car birds to, and sometimes birds can go in one environment or the other, each one of them creates its own separate independent bird engine. Because once you get a handful of birds played into the forest or the wetlands or whatever, you will occasionally get to run those birds, which means uh, in a successive order, activate every single one of those birds. And so much of this game is about getting the right birds at the right time, placing them into the right slots so that you can make a a really powerful engine when you run and when you activate all your wetland birds or all your woodland birds. And the beautiful thing is because you've got two or three different engines in parallel, you are designing these engines so this particular engine can supplement this other engine over here. This is an amazing engine building game with a wonderful, fun, charming, lovely, most beautifully presented theme of, you know, uh, you know, bird habitat building. And we absolutely love it. I mean, it doesn't hurt that this has got one of the highest production values of any game that came out this year. Uh, you know, right up there with Coloma and a, a couple more games that are coming later on. Uh, you know, with with with, the, with this really wonderful uh, dice tower that comes with the game and these lovely little I don't know if they're ceramic or but uh, eggs that you collect because of course birds lay eggs as you might imagine. Um, I can't imagine I'm going to be the only person who puts this in their top 10 of the year because it is so well loved. It's already gotten its first expansion. First game was based on I think North American birds and now the second one is European birds and I think this uh, has a very. It, it, this one's going to be around for a long time. It's so lovely and charming. Fast playing, but on the surface, it seems really simple. Hey, you discard some cards to be able to play the cards you want to play to build your engine, run your engine, get more resources, repeat. But it does it so well. Amazingly, from a first-time designer, Elizabeth uh, Hargraves? Is that right? Uh, anyway, Elizabeth, congratulations. It's amazing. And I'm not alone in that because it won the Kennerspiel this year. And well-deserved. I think it did. I could be wrong about that. Uh, but uh, regardless of all that, it is my number seven, Wingspan. Then we got number six, On Tour. Now, this is, uh, compared to what I've talked about before, this is a very lightweight, fast, little... Teach anybody in seconds, everybody up and running, um, roll and write game. And uh, yeah, is it the best roll and write out there on the market? It's certainly one of them. And if you don't believe me, go watch my run through where I actually play it with Jen. And if you check the show notes on my run through video, you'll see a file you can download so you can play along with me. This is a bingo style roll and write. Where every round, or yeah, every round, a couple of dice are rolled. They're d10s, amazingly, which is always fun. And uh, um, you have to use both of those dice. Uh, if you have a three and a seven, you have to uh, mark on a map of the continental United States a route that your band is going to travel while they are on tour. If you have that 3-7, you have to write 37 in one town and 73 in another town. If you roll the 2 and a 9, you have to roll 29 and 92. And what you're trying to do is create a contiguous, sinuous line that represents a, uh, a tour route that hits the most spaces possible. And that sounds really, really simplistic. And it is, but from that incredibly simple gameplay idea, a very tense, very exciting, incredibly compelling and fun experience comes out. I mean, obviously it is because it's my number six of the year. But again, I don't have to dwell on this too terribly long. The production is great. Check it out. Uh, but more importantly, if you haven't tried it, go watch my run through, download so you can make your own little copy of the board, play along, and I think you will be just as impressed as I am with my number six on tour. Then we've got number five. And Jamie Stegmeier of Stonemeyer Games is back 
with tapestry. He wasn't satisfied, um, you know, getting the Kenner spiel with Wingspan. He, uh, from Elizabeth, he had to put out his own design, tapestry, and I love it so, so very much. Although I think tapestry might go down as maybe the most controversial game of the year, uh, because... For, uh, forget it. For no good reason as far as I'm concerned, because I think the game is amazing. Uh, it is a civilization-themed Euro uh, where every turn, it couldn't be simpler. There are four progress tracks. One for science, one for military, uh, you know, and, and you know, off these four different tracks, one for culture, you are going to move forward on one of them. And then you will do whatever it says on that space you've moved to. It couldn't be any simpler. But, uh, well, much like Wingspan, all oh, this is a very different style game from that incredibly simple germ of an idea. So many amazing, wonderful, and satisfying combinatorial strings of actions will erupt. And a big part of this game is that makes me love it is there is so much setup variability. Because Every time you play, I forget, I think there are 16 unique civilizations that have wildly, radically different special powers that will make you feel like you're almost playing a different game every time you play. But then on top of that, you are always uh, massaging a hand of tapestry cards. Uh, these are the tapestry of history that tell the story of your civilization. And every once in a while, you'll get to play one of those, and those cards are... Every one of them is so powerful. They can cause you to pivot on a dime and change your entire strategy for the whole game. And finding your, navigating your way through the very simple action of just activate one of those tracks, but occasionally play your tapestry cards and try as best as you can to leverage the strength of your personal civilization just gives this game legs for days. Now, one thing I should say, uh, in case you've gone out and gotten it, heck, maybe off the strength of my effusive praise when I did a run-through for it earlier this year. Um, if you actually, I didn't make a deal of this in the run-through, I probably should have. Jamie did mention in the rule book that, um, you know, some of the balance of the different civilizations was subject to change uh, because it's such a big, insanely asymmetrical game. It was kind of hard to necessarily... I mean, with the thousands of man-hours they did of playtesting, they were worried they might need to do a little bit more balancing, and they have. There is now... Uh, Stonemaier Games has released a, an update to the rules that tweaks and balances some of the different civilizations. And if you have tried the game and you've thought, well, I really like it, but it seems like some of these civilizations are very unbalanced, well, the developers are working on that right now. So I just do say that as a public service announcement, even if they had never done that. For me, the game, I have not played a bad game of this, and I've played it almost a dozen times this year. I probably played more Tapestry than any other game of the year, because Jen, I just kept going back to it over and over again. Um, but if you were bothered by the fact that you were worried about some of the balance, that is something the developers have taken into account, and it almost has kind of a video game feel, that they've kind of patched the game post-release. Some people think that's outrageous and they should have spent an additional three years of development to make sure everything was balanced, but I'm happy. Um, you know, they, hey, they've had, they've gone from thousands of man hours to hundreds of thousands of man hours of games played now because so many people bought this game and so they were able to make some tweaks and adjustments. I think that's cool. But hey, I'm a former video game developer myself. I've also been known to patch a few of my games sure not. So maybe I'm a bit more uh, sympathetic than the average board gamer. But regardless, all of that aside, Tapestry is wonderful. It's my number five. Then we move on to number four, Tiny Towns. And this is, well, I was about to say this is another bingo game, like on tour. It is, depending on how you want to play it. The game actually has a couple of different variants. But at its heart, this is a game where everybody is competing to build the best tiny town they can. And it really does feel, now that I put them right next to each other, I say them out loud, it does feel like a nice companion for Tapestry. Because Tapestry is a really simple game of just taking a simple action and watching a huge civilization flourish and blossom over millennia. Tiny Towns is about taking a really simple action and watching a tiny little town grow up right in front of you. Um, although both games feature a huge amount of replayability because of all the setup variability. Every time you play, you're going to get a different combination in Tiny Towns of unique 
uh, buildings that you could be building that give you all kinds of special scoring and uh, opportunities and all that. And it works so well. This, by the way, like on tour, is another opportunity that if you want to play it in the bingo mode, where every round um, a, a resource gets drawn from a bag and everybody gets to take that resource, put it somewhere in their town, and potentially use it to build one of the buildings they're trying to do, so everybody's getting the same input. If you want to play along with me, go check out my run-through where I demonstrated that. You'll just need a few cubes and a piece of paper, and you can get a sense for what Tiny Towns play is like. But it gets even more interesting when you play the standard way, where instead of uh, somebody drawing a cube out of a bag and that's the resource everybody gets, on my turn, I pick a resource that I need for my town, and not only me, but everybody around the table gets that uh, resource. And then when it's your turn, you pick a resource. And... Like I was talking about earlier with Coloma, a big part of this game when you're playing the full version is, right, I think I know what it is you want to build. I'm, I, I'm IDing that. I can see you're going for the, uh, the, the storehouse or something like that. I bet you that means you're going to draw, you're going to call for wheat on your turn. And if I'm right, I better start putting some stuff so I could take advantage of the wheat that you're going to call for. And of course, you're trying to do the same thing to me. And again, like Coloma before it, uh, you know, even though there's no real interaction between players, I'm not stealing stuff from you or uh, racing or you know, uh, you know, denying you resources. But I am so intertwined with every step of what you do because it can so directly affect me. Because every player's turn is important to me, not just mine. It's a fun, fast, tense little game. Don't believe me? Watch my run through. Play along with me and decide for yourself. My number four, Tiny Towns. Then we move on to number three, Black. Angel. Now, this is my long awaited. I've been waiting for this game for years. And it was my number one most anticipated game for this year and my number one most anticipated game for last year, 2018 as well. And it finally arrived. This is basically the heir apparent to one of my top 10 games of all time, Twa. And it Black Angel, like Twa before it, they run off of the same basic dice drafting uh, engine where I have a handful of dice that represent all the potential things I could do. I'm gonna every once in a while I'm gonna roll them. They go into a pool, and I'm gonna try and figure out right how am I gonna use these different dice to activate the different things I need to do. Uh, and in this game, the things I need to do are keep the Black Angel, which is humanity's last hope. It is a seed ship traveling from a ruined, devastated Earth to a faraway planet where it is going to have humanity blossom once more because all it's carrying is DNA and AI because it's going to take thousands of years to get there. And so I'm an AI trying to keep the ship going. So are you. But we are, we have, we're kind of dueling AIs and we don't necessarily agree about the best way to go about it. So anyway, I got my dice, I need to use them, and I noticed, oh, you've got a die I want. Well, this turn, rather than use one of my own, I could pay you a resource and use one of your dice. Thank you very much. That's exactly what I needed. And of course, you can do the same for me. And um, while some people might find that as kind of aggressive theft, I've never really thought of it that way. Because the thing is, like Twa before it, in Black Angel, after I roll those dice and I put them in my little... Those are not my dice. Those are dice I've created, but they're really available to anybody. They're available to me for free, but for you, they just cost a resource. So if you look at it from the certain point of view, uh, it is not necessarily a mean-spirited game where players are stealing from each other because nobody owns these dice, man. Um, but the grabbing those dice leads to such a rich simulation with so many different things going on. There is the uh, the act of keeping the ship flying because it takes damage from Ravager attacks. There is the act of sending out scout ships to all the different systems as we're flying our way to Spes, our final destination. Uh, Spes, by the way, is Latin for hope. They really should have put that in the rule books. Everybody thinks Spes. What kind of name of our planet is Spes? Uh, but anyway, so you could be focusing on basically, uh, you know, engaging in diplomatic uh, uh, activities with the aliens you come into contact with or keeping the ship running or upgrading your own AI. There's this whole little sub game where you've got subroutines you can program into your own AI brain and then run them to give you special powers. I love this game. And the only thing that keeps it from being the number one spot. Because uh, it is so good. And Jen, she loves it too. We both played it now a few times. Uh, my only complaint is, I compare it to Trois, which did a lot of the same stuff, but it was in a provincial French 
uh, uh, city that we were, we were you know drafting the dice and trying to hold on to them and all that. Twa had a lot more really cool involved powers you could do with those dice. In this game, the actions you can do with the dice are a little bit more simple, a little bit more straightforward. And if they had had a little bit more variety to them, Black Angel probably would be my number one of the year. Um, but as it is, number three ain't bad, and that's where it's sitting, Black Angel. Then we move on to number two, Marvel Champions, the card game. And full disclosure, this, if you come back in April, I may be at that point declaring it has moved from my number two spot to my number one spot. Because I am so in love with this game. It does everything I want it to do flawlessly, perfectly. I am a lifelong Marvel comic book fan. And so, the way that this cooperative uh, action-adventure card game brings all of my favorite characters to life, uh, you know, just basically through a handful of cards and a motley crew of different gameplay mechanisms that those cards, you know, deliver to you, really, just with these simple gameplay kind of primitive sticks and stone tools that the designers had at their disposal, they have made me feel closer to having um, true comic book adventures as Spider-Man goes up against Kang or Miss Marvel takes down Ultron or whatnot. Not Miss Marvel, she's not available yet. Captain Marvel right now. Miss Marvel's coming soon. Um, it It's just amazing. I, I And while... I'd almost be a little bit hesitant. I'd almost be thinking that, hey, maybe I'm looking at through at this thing with rose-colored glasses because I am such a lifelong comic book junkie, and maybe that's tempering my, um, my 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 feelings about the game. My wife loves it too, and she could care less about Marvel comics uh, or superheroes in general. She likes them, but she could take them or leave them, and she thinks it's amazing. Also, um, the the last time we played it, she said, "Yeah, you know what? If we were normal people." I could totally see us really falling down the rabbit hole with this and this becoming kind of a lifestyle game for us uh, in much the same way that previously Gloomhaven did. And, uh, I, it's, it's, and it's a testament to the design of this game that it is so rich and so atmospheric and so thematic when in fact all we're doing is just playing cards, tapping cards, uh, keeping track of some simple resources and whatnot, and I love it to pieces. So why did I say maybe it'll make it to number one? Here's the deal. The base box comes with five heroes, three villains, and a couple of schemes for them to... Additional schemes that you can mix and match and have a fair bit of variability. The uh, method for putting out more content for this is pr bringing out booster packs that have, hey, here's one devoted to Captain America. Here's one devoted to the Green Goblin. Here's one devoted to Thor, or what have you. I haven't gotten a chance to play any of these. I am... Waiting. I feel like I'm the last reviewer in the world to get some copies of these because I, I see reviews coming up all the time. I really want to try them out because if the developers can continue with these new characters who are so functionally, fundamentally different than the characters I've already come to know and love in the base game, if they can keep up the level of creativity and imagination they use to bend those... Um, uh, mechanics, those mechanisms into a true Marvel experience, if they can keep that up, I'll have no choice but to bump this up into the number one spot. But I can't say if they have or not because I haven't played them yet. From what I've seen, I I'm really impressed. Uh, but time will tell if uh, Marvel Champions, which is currently my number two, ultimately climbs to the number one spot. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Make mine Marvel. But at th this point, today, I do have a number one, and I love it so much. It is Maracaibo. This is the latest game from designer Alexander Pfister. He had my number one game last year with Blackout Hong Kong, and he totally outdoes himself. As far as I'm concerned, Maracaibo is his current high-water masterpiece. It is, as far as I'm concerned, better than Great Western Trail, better than Mombasa, better than Isle of Skye. Uh, and that is saying something, because this guy, it is... Uh, I, he's nowhere near supplanting Steffenfeld as my favorite board game designer of all time, but man... Unlike any other designer in the industry, he is so on that track. If there's anybody working today who could potentially supplant my favorite board game designer, it's Alexander Pfister and it's works like Maracaibo that really make me feel that. Um, 
And it's heart. This is a pretty simple buccaneer pirate Euro style game where we are just sailing the Spanish main, looking to get into trouble and, um, you know, find fortune and glory. Very much. I mean, the designer has said that he was very much inspired by, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean without the supernatural element. So more like, I guess, the Disney Pirates of the Caribbean ride at the park instead of the actual feature films. Although you could say he's equally inspired by Treasure Island or anything like that. And, um... While the core mechanisms of sailing your ship uh, around the board in a circular pattern, it's very the board is very much a rondelle, uh, where you can move clockwise around the board, uh, come into different ports to give you access to different abilities. Every turn you're going to move forward a little bit, and everybody's racing to get to the best spots possible. The core gameplay is really, it's. It, it, it's it's very... It, there's nothing that's really unique or special about it. Probably the most unique thing about it is, while this is a, at its core a Rondell game, it is one with branching paths, although we've seen that before. But more importantly, I've never seen a Rondell game where you can, for free, move up to seven spaces. That may not sound like much, but it has such a huge impact compared to your Navigadors and all the other Rondell games out there where, hey, you get to move maybe three spaces, and if you really pay a lot of money, you can move a fourth. In this game, it is everything about this game is a race. You are zipping along at full speed, and this has a sense of velocity that most Euro-style economic simulations does not have. And I absolutely love that, especially because... Um, it is a game that encourages you to go fast because you, if you move to full effect, even though that means you might be skipping over certain islands that can be very lucrative for you, the faster you move, the more bonus stuff you will get where you ultimately end up. And that's a very simple little tool that Fister uses to create this sense of velocity and momentum that you normally wouldn't see in a game like this. Or, say, a game like Great Western Trail, which uh, you know this has more than a few elements uh, in common with. So I love that. But all that aside... That, all that stuff would have put this in the top 10. What puts it in the number one spot is another thing that Alexander Pfister has been pushing now for years is the idea of bringing story-driven content into your dry, soulless, Euro-style economic simulations. And this is where he has done his best job to date. If I recall correctly, the main storyline of this game has 11 chapters. I've played through four of them so far. And, uh, you know, they're pretty straightforward narrative chapters. There is a problem that's affecting the whole Caribbean. There's a person who might have the solution. Oh no! Can we find him? He's gone missing! Uh, were pirates involved? Oh, there's a mysterious stranger who might have information. Um, I'm making stuff up like that. That's not necessarily the real story. I don't want to do any spo uh, story spoilers there. But those are the kind of beats that you will be playing through. And these are the kind of things you would expect to see in a uh, action-adventure video game or an Ameritrash-style game. But you see them in a Euro, where the gameplay is all about maximum efficient usage of resources to gain victory points. But amongst the core gameplay, which is really sharp, there is a narrative that makes me want to play again to find out, well, who was the mysterious stranger in the shadows uh, and and make choices of am I going to chase after that or am I going to follow up um, this other lead in uh, in Puerto Vallarta or whatever and you know there are actual branches in this storyline that will play out that actually change the world this is not a legacy game this there are no stickers in here but if I choose to follow the dark mysterious stranger that might lead to stormy skies and half of the board becomes very very difficult to navigate in future missions and that happened because of a choice I made in a story. I am not saying this is going to be some kind of Pulitzer Prize winning story. It's pretty straightforward, standard video game level quality. But the fact that it works so well and that it has such a big impact on the evolving state of the pirates of the Caribbean world that I am playing in just makes me fall in love with this so much. Uh, because, don't get me wrong, these are very early experiments in board game storytelling that Alexander Pfister is doing. And he keeps bringing them into game after game after game. And this is the one where he's pushed it the furthest. You know, I'm, I'm liking... I, I think back to the early 80s when storytelling started working its way into video games. Because uh, you weren't just a nameless ship fighting nameless aliens. You were some guy named Jumpman who was trying to save the girl from Kong. Or you were Miss Pac-Man and every couple of rounds you got a cute little story. Show, you know, a little snippet. So you got more of a sense of character. That's kind of where board games are at this point. We are not to the point where we are going to supplant, um, you know 
uh, movies or television or novels or anything like that, but we are taking steps towards that. And that's what makes me so exciting. So excited because board games are my drug. I love them and I love storytelling and I love seeing the two come together. And like I said, nobody's done it better than Alexander Pfister so far. And this is the best example he's done of it to date in a game that already would have been top 10 candidate anyway. That's what brings Maracaibo into my number one spot. And that's it, folks. My current thinking as of December 25th for my top 10 games of the year. Like I said before, check back in April. A uh, few games might have pushed their way in. I'm looking at you, Walking in Province. I'm looking at you, Miyabi. I'm looking at you, It's a Wonderful World. Uh, oh, man. I mean, there, there are many opportunities. And, folks... If my game didn't make the list, I apologize, but bear in mind, there are so many wonderful games that come out every year that just, even though I can recognize how brilliant they are, they're just not a game for me and Jen. Res Arcana or Ecos, brilliant, brilliant games that deserve to be in a top 10, but this was my subjective list of what Jen and I have enjoyed the most. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this trip down this list a little bit as well. And uh, hopefully see you in April when we revisit it. And otherwise, folks, have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye